It's a blue tsunami, or maybe a blue wave, or a blue ripple, or hell, maybe the Republicans will hold the House of Representatives. I don't know, neither do you, but this race has gotten so crazy, and we're just getting into the part of it where people who are not, you know, crazy political YouTube viewers are actually starting to pay attention. So I thought it was time to have a right angle bull session on the big November midterms with Bill Whittle and Scott out, of course. I'm Steve Green. Hi, everybody. All right, uh, gentlemen, I originally wanted to kind of do this, do uh, you think they'll do it? Are the Democrats too crazy? Are the Republicans uh, too lazy? Because uh, what we've seen now is uh, this almost complete lack of messaging on the part of the GOP. And Bill, you talked about this on Bill Whittle now in, in just the last couple of days, that the Republicans have totally failed to sell their biggest achievement, which is uh, tax reform. So, uh, Scott, let me put the question to you. Does the GOP want to keep the House? Is Paul Ryan just so frustrated that not only is he quitting, but he's he's going to just like sabotage the House majority along with him? Maybe it's subconsciously, I should say. Yes, he's doing it unconsciously. Um, there is, I think it's difficult to tell uh, because Congress is a strange critter. Um, even though we discuss it on the national level and we um, aggregate all these numbers and we hear Larry Sabato making predictions about uh, you know, what may happen and how many states the Republicans are up and how many states the Democrats are up, whatever. Ultimately, congressional races are decided in relatively small districts by a relative handful of people in isolated areas around the country. And some of those people are just voting party line or just voting because they support or oppose the president. But a lot of times those races are being uh, decided by issues you know not uh, about. You know nothing about them because you're not in that community. You know, I know I've lightly followed the congressional race back where I used to live in Pennsylvania. And uh, right now, last I saw it, looked like the Democrat was leading by a little bit in the polls. But what you don't know if you read that on a national level is that that district is 35 percent Republican, 50 percent. Uh, it's like 15 percent advantage for the Democrats, basically. Oh, so and it's so, like, the, like a Cook rating of D plus 15. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. And and so what you don't see there is, you know, well, is this the turnout model? Is this just registered voters? Is this, you know, how do they know? How, how can they predict this? Do I have to be worried about it? And there's all kinds of issues I don't want to get into because they're so particular to that race that people will be thinking about and deciding that race based on those things, not the things that we're talking about here on the national level. So, you know, I, I think... You do see a, a distinctive lack of leadership in the House of Representatives. I'm not sure that that is a bad thing. Um, after all, you know, you're not supposed to have a petty pope or little, uh, you know, president of the lawmakers uh, in that hall. I mean, it should Newt be, Gingrich. Yeah, I mean, it, theoretically, it should be a whole body of, of equals with, you know, rotating through leadership positions only because they have to have somebody bang the gavel. So, uh, you know, I it's hard to tell what kind of will there is to win. But, you know, clearly John Boehner got so discouraged that he had to get the heck out of town. <laughs> and we, we've, done a pretty, we've done a pretty good job of beating the tar out of Paul Ryan since he's got in there. It's amazing how much people love you until you get in a position of, uh, of authority. Oh, and Paul so, Ryan practically had to be bribed into the job after, uh, yeah. after we handed Boehner out, yeah. And now that SOB is just power hungry and has betrayed all his fundamental principles. <laughs> so, um, I think there's so much that none of us really know about the day-to-day -day workings of this that it's hard to make predictions. Um, that said, there's also a lot of behind the scenes activity going on in these local districts where the national organization is helping to fund local candidates, where people are being bussed in on the ground to help knock on doors and make phone calls and things like that. So I, I think it's gonna be another quirky American election and we're gonna love it right down to the very end until we find oh, yeah. out who won. Oh, yeah, and I, I don't want any actual, any actual predictions from anybody because those are just absolutely stupid and, and yes. pointless. Nope, nobody knows what's going to happen in November, least of all us. But, uh, Bill, I saw something really interesting on Twitter today. Uh, this is from a gentleman named Peter Cook. Uh, he wrote on Twitter, I left the GOP after Trump won the nomination and did not vote for him in November. The left's descent into madness since with their treatment of Kavanaugh and now chasing senators out of restaurants, the Ted Cruz thing that I think mm -hmm. we're going to talk about elsewhere this week, is my breaking point. I'm voting straight GOP this year. Uh, so this goes back to the, the flip side, Bill, of the question I gave to, to, to Scott. 
is the House, is our government so fundamentally broken that subconsciously the Democrats are sabotaging their own chances of retaking the House with this descent into madness? Well, the, the descent into madness is not voluntary and it's not part of a strategy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a descent into madness. It's the race and date, nobody yeah. descends into madness on purpose. The idea that they're crazy like a fox is just plain wrong. That tweet encapsulates everything that I think is going on in this country. Uh, yeah. And if you combine that with the walk away movement, which is rapidly becoming the runaway movement, and don't tell anybody you ever belong to the Democratic Party, <laughs> you may have a uh, you may have a, a bit of a surprise coming in November. Uh, it just needs to be said that traditionally the off year elections favor the party that lost the presidential election. So there's a strong historical current that we're swimming against. And I do think that this person is absolutely right. I, 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 up until just a few moments ago, actually, I thought the question is going to be, um, will, will enough disgust from the Democrats, you know, basically cause them to, to not come out or enough people leaving? But now I realize that, that what we see with the Kavanaugh thing and the Cruz thing and all the rest of these these things, um, they they did it to Charlie Kirk uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and all of the Antifa and all of the and all of the stuff which has happened after Donald Trump was elected. I think is I think it's motivating Republicans in a way that they were not motivated before, and I happen to think that this Kavanaugh thing is so repulsive, and so nakedly transparent that it may cost the Democrats the House. Uh, and this would be the same kind of ironic justice that, or celestial justice anyway, that you know was inflicted on Hillary Clinton, who should be in jail, but if she was in jail, she'd be a martyr. Now she's just a woman who lost and, 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 and gets to think about it every day on talk shows and, and explain why more hairdressers voted for, for her than, than uh, uh, other Americans did. So, the, look, the good news is, I think things look much better than they did a while ago. Uh, GOP numbers are high. Uh, quite high. Uh, there is also the whole idea that a lot of people are still reluctant to say that they support Donald Trump. You can't say you support Donald Trump in L.A. I mean, I don't know what the percentage of people in L.A. who actually voted for Trump was, but let's just say for the sake of it, it was 25 uh, percent. That's one in four. And there's not one in four people out there talking about how they like Donald Trump. Everybody's quiet because the, the, the left wing smash machine oh, yeah. uh, will make sure that you never get a chance to eat in another restaurant again. Um, so if I had to guess, I would say that, that what they have done with this Kavanaugh thing is put the spurs to people like that gentleman whose tweet you just read. Uh, people, Republicans who may be like, hey, look, you know, either I didn't vote for Trump or I was a never Trumper, or on the other hand, people who are enthusiastic Trump supporters who watched the Republican Congress just, you know, uh, dither and, and, and backtrack and, 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 and go wobbly and and disgusted with the Republican Party in general because they thought Trump was going to drain the swamp and it turns out that half the swamp is incumbent Republicans. This Kavanaugh thing has sharpened uh, has sharpened the blade I think significantly. It certainly sharpened it for me yeah. and um, and I think that that would be a tremendous moral and 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 ethical uh, justice if it ended up costing them the election, even though, as we discussed in Scott's episode, uh, there is no potential good that can come out of somebody's personal destruction that I want to be any part of. Yeah, I love you know, it's Democrats probably only lose. like lose. It's just a shame that Republicans have to win. Uh, I'm sorry, Scott, I just stepped on you. I was going to say, that there's probably only about 25% of the electorate that are the really diehard Donald Trump fans. Um, and then there are a lot of people, like Bill described, who are kind of ambivalent, and that guy who wrote that tweet, who are you know, sort of like, well, I wasn't uh, I wasn't for him before, but after what the Democrats have done, I'm, I'm now in his camp. And I've seen that that stat used to say to kind of poo poo the possibility that Donald Trump has coattails for the midterm elections. Um, and I've even read a story today where they were saying, you know, Trump saying there's going to be a red wave may make Republican voters complacent. I I don't know anything about how these numbers work or how the you know who knows what evil lurks in the minds yeah. of men but I do know Shadow knows I do know <laughs> that so far every time the media thinks they've got Donald Trump by the short hairs it turns out to be the opposite 
and yeah. he and winds up grinning like a Cheshire cat and uh, that uh, the media is scratching their heads and wondering Hillary Clinton book title, what happened? <laughs> you know, Scott, you, you just made me think of something that we didn't cover in your Kavanaugh segment that we just finished taping a few minutes ago, and that's how many uh, not hyper-partisan left-wing women are watching these Kavanaugh hearings and thinking, man, that could be my husband mm. with or my son. these false accusations. My, my son, son yeah. my nephew, ex- exactly. And maybe they were leaning on, uh, leaning towards voting Democrat in the fall, but think, I can't endorse that kind of thing. And you, you never know. You, you read articles uh, and, and see videos about how um, black parents say that you don't understand how I've got to talk to my son about how to behave in a traffic stop, for example, um, oh, because of the heart. disproportionate risk that he would face of getting himself in trouble or getting himself shot in their, in their minds. Okay, this same conversation, if it hasn't already happened, now has to happen um, with mothers and fathers talking to their sons and saying, mm-hmm. look, here's it. Now, now, I'm not saying that's altogether a bad thing. I do think that there's something to be said for, you know, don't get yourself into risky positions. Uh, keep your wits about you. Don't be alone with a woman who's not your wife so that you can't later be accused of something, you know. And, and whatever you do. Hang out together whatever, as, cr- as a, gr- a crowd, you know. And whatever you do when you're in college, make sure that you don't go to parties and don't have a single drop of alcohol. That's the most important life lesson <laughs> that you can learn from all of this. Except even that apparently isn't uh, much much protection because these allegations can come from anywhere. I had a uh, I, I when my 12 year old was probably about 10, I gave him the very short version of the talk, which was if you get a girl pregnant before you're married, I will kill you dead. And that was. <laughs> And I, Clear? I, I, I think that's concise and to the I, point. I, I, I <laughs> hope right. it's sunk in. Uh, but more seriously, is uh, you don't want we, him to be punished with a baby. <laughs> well, just get married first. You know, finish school, get married, have children. Just do it in the right order, and you'll have a yeah. successful life. And that's another segment we did this week. I'm, I'm getting off the point here. What I want to talk about is this: between 2009 and 2012, I watched the. Well, we all did. In fact, we all took part in the birth and the snowballing Tea Party movement, that is before the IRS and the establishment GOP snuffed it out. Uh, But there was a phenomenon I saw as a part of the Tea Party movement, especially after Mitt Romney got the Republican nomination in 2012, and I called them broken glass voters. These were the people who were so sick of four years of Obama's ineptitude and and divisiveness that they would crawl naked over broken glass just to vote for Mitt Romney, even though they didn't actually trust Mitt Romney very much to be a, a real conservative or even a very solid Republican. And I, I, I really believed, maybe it'd be more accurate to say I allowed myself to believe, I, I suckered myself into believing that these broken glass voters would be enough to, to put Mitt Romney over the top, and it was probably one of the worst calls I've ever made in my life. And and it and it's so uh, get, getting that so wrong uh, really blinded me to the possibility of Trump winning in 2016, and that's a case where I'm so happy to have been wrong. What we don't know is if there are enough of these broken glass voters like uh, like Peter Cook on Twitter to let the GOP House stay the GOP House. All I can hope is that uh, that they're out there, they mean it, and they're going to show up in November. So uh, stay stout, strong. Uh, it can be done. It can be done. I don't know if it'll be. I don't know if it will happen. I just know it can happen. So uh, stay strong. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Stay tuned to BillWhittle.com too. See you next time. 